Okay. Tell me if you can hear me. If you can I hear can me all right, we're going to go without this. Good. Right, so. We can hear you. We can hear you. I'll Perfect. keep it for now. Perfect. Just in case. Just in case. Just in case. My name is Virgil. I'm on the board of directors of the Savannah Cemetery. I've been involved with this cemetery on and off in different ways since 1940. So I've been around here for a while. I was born five miles that way, lived five miles that way. Uh, the Savannah, it's quite a place. Uh, most people don't realize it. I talk to people all the time. I've driven past here every day for years and they have no idea what's here. Uh, a little, let's go to a little background. Uh, Columbus got back from his second trip. And, <laughs> yeah, a little background. And uh, Portugal and Spain had a big conference. And they had a lot of guts. They divided the world up between them. Portugal took the old world. Spain took the new world. So that's how Spain wound up with control of California. Another big word for this state. In 1510, a Spanish author wrote a book about black Amazonian women, naked, with gold weapons, living on an island. The island they lived on was named California. So one of the early explorers uh, set this island up kind of bad because he had California as an island, and that's how we wound up with the name of California. He liked the book, I guess. I don't know. But uh, in uh, 1871, two Franciscan friars, each with an attendant, ten Spanish soldiers with a sergeant, and three mule skinners camped on the edge of what became the Santa Ana River. Their first night was joyous, they had an earthquake. So uh, that was their welcoming. They decided to look around. They didn't like that spot. It had been pre-scouted, but they didn't like that spot for a mission. So they scouted around, and they found a place on the banks of the San Gabriel River they liked better. Or as my English teacher, more better. Uh, <laughs> and they started to build the San Gabriel Mission. 15 guys. Think about it, there was no Rite Aid, there was no Lowe's, <laughs> no Home Depot. They had nothing, absolutely nothing. They commenced to build a mission. They were doing pretty good. Now the mission they built is not the one that's up here. It was down almost in Pico Rivera. It was on Rosemead in Washington. And they went along for about four years. Big storm came up. The mission went down the river. No. Uh, so they had to start all over again. They had their orchards, their vineyards. They had done quite a bit, but it was all gone. So that's when they moved up and started the mission up here. Uh, the San Gabriel in the chain was considered the most successful mission uh, in the entire chain in California. Uh, if a little side note, if any of you ever had a chance to get up to Lompoc. La Purissima up there has been restored as it was when they built it. It's gorgeous up there. Beautiful place to go. Uh, highly recommend it. Anyway, two things happened in uh, 1876. The Mexican American War ended. Nine days later, they discovered gold up at Sutter's Fort. Now think about that. If gold discovery was done today, how long would it take for the message to get back to the East Coast? <laughs> oh, I bet you'd do it less than that. Uh, so it's pretty fast. But when they discovered gold, you got to think about back then. That message had to get on a horse and ride from Sutter's Fort down to San Francisco. Then that message had to get on a boat and sail down the coast of California, Baja California, down to Panama. Then that message had to get on a mule or a horse and ride across Panama. Then that message had to get on another boat and go across the Gulf of Mexico, around Florida and up to coast. It was a six-month trip. So. Now the message has gotten back to the East Coast. Well, it still took a while to come in to the middle of the country. 
So, in 1848, the, one of the first wagon trains started, I'm sorry, 1849, the first wagon train came from Missouri. Actually, there was two. We'll, we'll follow the one that came here. They both came here, but we'll call the one I want to follow. Uh, <laughs> the Mormons started a train, and they were coming out here originally, 500 of them, to help fight the Spanish-American War. But by the time they got to the back of Collin Pass, the war basically was over. So they went over the pass, turned left, started San Bernardino. The next wagon train to come over came across Cajon. And one thing you have to understand, they couldn't get across Cajon with the wagons. They had to unload them, take the wagons apart, lower the wagons down on the other side, put them back together, load them up again, and then head this way. They'd been walking from Missouri for 16 months to get here. They're pretty pooped. <laughs> uh, they've had a lot of problems. There were several families that said nuts to the gold. The first place we find that has good water, good wood, and plowable land, that's where we're going to settle. That was El Monte. Only they called it Lexington. And then the next wagon train started another community in El Monte, and they called it the Willows. When El, uh, California became a state, the state legislature changed the name to El Monte for whatever reason. Anyway, when they had problems and people started passing away, they couldn't bury them in El Monte. They had a problem. They dig down four feet, there was water. Now, let's digress a little bit. This property was owned by a man named Dalton. You, some of you probably heard the name. It's pretty prominent. Dalton. The Dalton family. Azusa. Azusa. He had his big ranch up in, in Azusa. All of the locals at this time, and at the time of California becoming a state in 1850, the population of the San Gabriel Valley, how many people lived here? Oh, okay, 72. Uh, they took a census. There were 72 members living here. Uh, Dalton was riding across his property. He sided with the, the Mexicans. That was, he was part of the Mexican family, Catholic. He spotted two graves somewhere right here. Two new graves. Who they were and where they are, we don't know. We haven't been able to authenticate. We have done a lot of research trying to find out who they were and have come up zero. My thoughts were during the Mexican-American War, there was a battle in Bassett, which was this way. There was a battle in East LA this way. Maybe it was a couple of expired soldiers from the, from the Mexican-American War. I don't know, that's just my thought. But anyway, in 1850, then, Pio Pico deeded this property to the El Monte Cemetery Association. We still have the handwritten document in the museum over in El Monte uh, that he signed turning this property over. So this, the first burial we know was sometime during the Mexican-American War, probably 1846, 47, somewhere in there. The cemetery was a little bigger. We know there are graves under Valley. We know they're under Mission, we know they're under the Fire Department, the Lions Lodge. We know they're under the apartment over there. But they've been lost to time. So, anyway, uh, here we are in 1850. The Thompsons, who were a very prominent family in the first wagon train, are back over on this side. You have over 30 names in here that streets have been named after in uh, El Monte and Rosemary. Steele family, very prominent. The next street over is Steele. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lot of names in here that have meant a lot to the area over the years. Like I say, I've been here since 1940. I attended my great-grandmother's funeral here in 1940. So uh, that's kind of the place. We have a lot of dignitaries in here. We have a lot of good stories, if that's possible which it is. We have a lot of sad stories. Uh, you get involved 
pretty heavily with uh, different people in here. We had very poor records handed to us a number of years ago. We've been trying to identify a lot of these people. We found a Wilbur Carmichael over in this corner, a veteran from World War II. He went through basic, went to Italy, was killed three months later. Highly decorated, two bronze stars, silver star, uh, purple heart, I don't know what else. Had no headstone. We couldn't find family. We know he had a sister, but she could have been married ten times by now. And who knows where she is. We called the VA. Two weeks later, the VA delivered a headstone to us. And that Memorial Day, that was about four years ago, we put his headstone. Uh, we have two young... Japanese boys buried over here. Their headstones. What's odd is their headstones are carved in Chinese. <laughs> oh, Japanese wasn't politically correct back then, for whatever reason. Uh, they were buried in the 20s. Somebody's still decorating those graves. Family somewhere comes in here every once in a while. So it's stories like that that. Uh, keeps it interesting for us but you know for me personally my great grandparents grandparents are in here and I'll I'll be back in that corner someplace someday uh, that's kind of us that's how we got here and we're here to stay <laughs> we don't think we're going anywhere uh, state law says that we can't so here we are anybody got any questions or yeah, Virgil, uh, Virgil, I was just hoping you could just round out a bit of the history, say, after 1900 to the present, when, when the city of Rosemead didn't exist, from what I understand, when the cemetery was, was founded. That's so, correct. So there was a bit of a... Well, it's been kind of interesting. The, the cemetery belongs to El Monte, the El Monte Cemetery Association. So for a long time we've had a situation of a Eh, it's been a cat fight. Uh, <laughs> Rosemead says, Baloney, you belong to El Monte. El Monte says, Baloney, you're in Rosemead. So it's been a number of years that we've been trying to put the two of them together. And we've been pretty successful in about the last five, six years. That they understand the situation and now are accepting, and they're both helping us tremendously. Uh, to promote this. We've got a lot of work to do in here. It sounds strange. Uh, this cemetery has outlived itself. Uh, all the money that was set aside for its upkeep was gone many, many years ago. So we have to work on donations. Uh, we just became a state historic status. Yay! Uh, yeah. That, that took us about, what, about six years? Uh, 20 years. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you want to go back? Yeah. No, it's we taken many. 20 years ago first. Uh, it's, it's taken many, many years. The state, oh, I'm sorry, but they were real butts with this whole thing. <laughs> uh, we submit an application. Well, it doesn't say this or it doesn't say what about this, what about this. So we'd redo it, send it back to them. They'd sit it on somebody's desk for a year and then they'd come. It was, it was unbelievable. But we finally got it. Uh, the state was interesting when we took over. Go ahead. I was going to ask, is there spaces available here, or do you have to be in the We can plant you anytime you want to go. <laughs> <laughs> we have about 230 spots available. We have brought in ground penetrating radar. We've been able to identify quite a few spots. It's been interesting. We had the Christian home that closed here not too long ago. They bought 10 spots many years ago. They turned them back to us, they never used them. So we got 10 spots that way. You have a lot of spots where he and she were married. He, he was put under, she survived, she remarried, she moved to Missouri, so they never used she's spot. Uh, so we still got she's spot here. And, uh, it was reversed too, we had he's, a lot of he's too. But, um, yeah, we got a little over 200 spots, that, and very reasonable. <laughs> very reasonable. Yeah.
and look at the history that would be around you. How do you find out the information? Yeah. How do you find out information? Go online. No, uh, when we're done, when we're done, I'll go back over and I'll get you a pamphlet that you can use. Uh, it is available. Yes, ma'am. So the he's and she's are still there, or they're relinquished after all these years? Legally, we can go to court and say she disappeared. She hasn't been here for a hundred years now, or what? You know, whatever the time is. But we can legally go to court and declare. Uh, a plot abandoned, and we have done so a couple of times. Uh, and plots come up for different reasons. We had uh, a gentleman we disinterred over here a while back and moved into Rose Hills next to his wife. So we had a spot come open there. That one really proved to be interesting. This fire station right here, there was a gentleman who was in there, worked there for over 20 years, fireman. He passed away. He basically was in it. He was living on the streets for whatever reason. He was living in his car. The fire department couldn't find any family whatsoever. The county called us and said, hey, do you have a spot? So the board got together and said, let's give it to that spot we just got. Let's give it to him. The county, LA County, went all out for this gentleman. They hired a horse-drawn Purse wow. from the 1880s, white horses, the black hearse, the horses had the black plumes, mm -hmm. the drivers had on 1880 costumes, they had bagpipers. We had about 350 people here, including the top chief of the LA County Fire Department. They started in the park, they had a parade with bagpipers, they came around, came in the gate, the fire department chaplain performed the service. And we buried the town. The uh, kids in the fire camps were pallbearers. Mm. So it was just, it, I'm sorry, it was neat. Maybe some people wouldn't think it was neat, but I thought it was neat. Um, we had a burial, and you can see it right here behind you, just uh, last week. Mm -hmm. Mr. Trippin Air. Uh, he was a pioneer in the area for a long, long time. When he left the church in the casket, he was on the back of his 1914 fire truck. They came from the church in a procession. There were 40 cars, not one car was older than 1919. Wow. And they were all dressed in costume of that period. It, it was neat. His son was here today, just a little earlier. But uh, we seem to get involved in very unique situations here. Oh, I was going to, when we called the state, we had a problem. When this board took over, we had a problem we couldn't answer. And we called the state. And they said, who? <laughs> we said to Savannah, who are you? Well, we're in Rosemead. We've been there since 1850. <laughs> Never heard of you. <laughs> they hadn't. They had no knowledge we even existed. They came out here. And they could have hurt us bad, because there's all kinds of rules and regulations and whatnot that they impose on Rose Hills and Forest Lawn and everybody else. They looked at us, smiled, and said, you're on your own, turn around and left. So we're on our own. But uh, I can't remember if they even answered the question. But anyway, uh, they've left us alone. We pretty much can proceed at our, our pace and what we want. Julie, um, sure. That was the second time we applied for uh, recognition in the state. First time was back in 1994, 95, and we had we actually hand delivered it up to the State Historical Society or Historical Monument uh, Society, and they had never heard of us back then. And we put our application it was yay big, and and they. We got that same reply. It was, no, we don't know you. You're on your own. So you know, this is the maybe the third time it's just a charm. Yeah, you know, because we, we put in the third application a couple years back, and we nursed it along. We had some really, really, really.
really dedicated people that spent a lot of time up at Washington, uh, up at Sacramento. Julio. Uh, yeah, I'm Julio. <laughs> Hat in hand, groveling, <laughs> and they finally got it. They finally got recognition and we went through the, the whole process and it's taken us about three or four years to complete the process. A guy named Eric Chase really yeah. ramrodded the oh, whole yeah. thing. His family's all out in through here. And the lady walking across right here in the checkered top, she's the one that did the final application. And they had to mold it a little bit, they had to change it a little bit. And, uh, but we got it. We are in the process now of developing a new entrance with our monument stone and our, our plaque, our bronze plaque. We're having that made in the foundry. Uh, if I ever it, get a reply. Yeah. <laughs> it, it does, it's, um, it's, it's unbelievable what you run into when you're, you, you would think it shouldn't be any problem at all running this place, but it, it's a lot of work. We put in a lot of work. He's put in almost two years. Longer, yeah, longer. Um, one of the things that um, I heard a question about is uh, you know, where you get your information. Well, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for people to help us get information. We have a database. But any of you have, who have done historical research know that it is a real difficult chore. Tedious, long, drawn Tedious. out. Tedious. You've got to go to a hundred different websites, you've got to ask a hundred different questions to a hundred different people, and it takes a lot of time. And I know that Heather over there, uh, she is a researcher and research. I'll give you an example, we have a, 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 a Confederate soldier, Colonel Eddie, that's all it says on his, uh, on his gravestone. So I did some research and uh, I found out that in the Smithsonian they have a letter from a Colonel Eddie who uh, represented um, Rhode Island uh, uh, Brigade. I said, well, golly, Colonel Eddie, Mary Becky, uh, Baker Eddie comes from Rhode Island. His, uh, his letters are in the Congress, and uh, he wrote a letter from Vicksburg. And I was all excited, and I called up Heather a couple of day, uh, days later, and she goes, no, he was born in Wisconsin. I said, where do you get that information? Well, she had gone somewhere else at another uh, uh, website and found it, dug it up. It is, it's hard work, but I tell you, it's like finding a uh, nugget of gold in, uh, in the ground when you do find it. Hey, hey, I got it. This little, and then they start telling the story. It's really, really a lot of fun. So if you're an amateur local history buff like I am, if you want to help us uh, uh, do some of that basic research, you know, in your spare time, uh, we, we welcome any help that you can uh, give us. And I can't tell you the gratification you have when you do find, it, it's like you're, uh, it's CSI brought home. <laughs> you know, it's, it's really, really a lot of fun and uh, very interesting. You'll start out with a question and all of a sudden you've got 12 answers yeah. to that same yeah. question. Uh -huh. And you got to narrow it down. And uh, we, uh, I guess all of us, that here are involved are really, really into the history of the area. Uh, and it's, it, it's a lot more than just this cemetery. It's I'll tell you, Heather, Heather was very instrumental also in making these plaques around here with a little yeah. history uh, 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 things and uh, getting the funding for it and all like that. Uh, the, 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 the gal, and uh, if she's here, I'm going to grab her and introduce you. She is amazing. She really is. And, uh, uh, most of the basic research for these uh, signs that you're going to be able to see and read are from her research. Uh -huh. So, and all the time she's been doing this, she's been going through chemo. Yep. Uh, yeah. Yep. So, she's something. I hope Any you join me with my quest because my quest is to uh, make this cemetery a stop for all fourth graders in the area oh, that'd be awesome. because they all go to the mission and they all oh, learn about pioneers but where in God's creation around here other than here can they actually see the pioneers that built on the, the uh, groundwork that the uh, uh, Spanish and the Mexican Americans did in Southern California. You know, I, I tell every class that comes here this 
is the birthplace of Southern California. It isn't Los Angeles. Los Angeles wasn't, didn't even exist when the mission was here. This is the, the crucible from which our uh, Southern California culture grew. And this is why it's so important that we have the, uh, the uh, significance dedicated to this plaque that we're going to have. Yeah, this cemetery or this mission was started in 1771. L.A. didn't start until 10 years later, 1781. And that in itself is one heck of a story. Uh, if some of you want to stick around, we can go through that story. It's just, <laughs> it's, uh, there's just story after story about this area. When you, when you stop and think about it, when this mission was started, 71 people here in this whole valley. Actually, it was from the mountains to Pico Rivera, from East LA to Banning. 71 people. And they used to have neat games on the ranchos. They'd go out and they'd lasso a grizzly, true. They'd lasso a big bull. They'd chain them together and then they'd make big bets as to who was going to win. Uh, it was a neat thing. There were so many horses at one time in this area and cattle, and donkeys, and mules that they actually gathered up. There's documentation they rounded up 10,000 head of horses took them down to the beach and destroyed all of them because they were eating everybody out of the house and home. Uh, and they all went out to see, I guess the sharks had a banquet for a while. But uh, <laughs> Leonard Rose, who uh, founded Rosemary, uh, was a um, victor. He grew uh, grapes for the first time and made people wine. In fact, uh, because of his sales ability, the acumen, that he went around all of uh, the East Coast and in Europe, he actually established the table wine industry in Southern California. From that, he uh, became a uh, horseman. He raised racehorses, and that's where the name uh, came uh, for Rosemead, Rose's Meadow. Mm -hmm. And he became a state senator, and then he went bankrupt and killed himself. And you had a state senator, Mount Wilson, Mr. Wilson, Mount Wilson. Who was his grandson? George S. Patton. General Patton. So there's a lot of people tied into this. Great story. uncle or whatever it was is buried right over here. Yeah. Virgil? Yes, ma'am. Where'd your family come from? I'm not telling. <laughs> <laughs> My mother was born in Long Beach. Her mother was born in Downey. My father was born in Illinois. I was born on Garfield, just this way, a few miles. Hospital still there, hadn't fallen down yet. <laughs> and I was raised in El Monte. I graduated from El Monte High School. My parents graduated from there. My father retired from the El Monte Police Department. So, like I said, I've been in and around this place since 1940. My great grandmother, my grandparents, and I'll probably be in this corner over here before it's over with someday. If you listen to my wife, anyway. Uh, I don't know. Randy took off. I don't know where he went. Is Heather going to something? She usually Should does. Should I go grab Heather? Huh? Should I go get Heather? So yeah, go over there and smack her upside the head and tell We're her to get over here. We're going to be dividing you up because uh, I, I don't know how many people are going to be doing some you, uh, guides. But All of you want to stay stay. What we'll do is take you through the cemetery. Um, just different stories of different people in here. There's a lot of dignitaries. There's judges, there's politicians, there's soldiers, there's children, uh, a lot of children. There's over a hundred children in here under the age of one. That uh, back then, your water was delivered from the mountains in a ditch. And it came down the ditch. You go out and get it and boil it. But typhoid, typhus, waterborne diseases killed off a lot of the children. Uh, the first city to have running water pipe to the houses was Alhambra. Uh, the son-in-law of the man that owned San Marino was an engineer and he started piping and they started selling the property. Uh, who water knows, pipe to your house. Who knows how Alhambra got the name? Uh, wasn't it in a book? What? Wasn't it in a book? Nope. The Alhambra, where is the... The Alhambra. Spain. 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 What is it? 
Castle. It's the castle. Oh, yeah, it's castle. Much like Hollywood Land, the big sign up there, there was a uh, land division and they were selling lots. And in order to draw the people who took the Pacific Electric uh, trolley past there, they had this huge uh, Spanish uh, uh, castle uh, motif, and they called it the Alhambra. That mm. was a gimmick to get the people out there to, to buy property. Now you know the whole story. The Rose Parade started as a gimmick for the realtors to sell property in, in Pasadena. That's how the Rose Parade got started. You can learn a lot no, of history know. if you look at the old the, uh, um, uh, maps. You know, the, the place names back a hundred years ago were quite different. And you say, well, why? And then you start uh, going into the uh, internet and finding why this was called this, and why that was called that, and why is it called that now? Uh, PE maps, uh, electric maps, offer a lot of really interesting stuff. You, a lot of you aren't old enough, but at one time we I had am. a comp I know you are. <laughs> uh, we had a complete electric railway system here. You could get in a rail for a car in Santa Monica and go to San Bernardino for a dime. Oh, wow. And now they're all out. Now they're putting it right back where it was originally. <laughs> Actually are. A lot of the routes that the, the um, Caltrans is following are the old PE. The old red lines. In fact, if you go down Huntington Boulevard, the big centerpiece. That was the old PE tracks. All PE tracks. We used to be able to get on in El Monte on the PE train for a nickel, ride into LA, have lunch at Clifton for a quarter, go to the movies for a dime, and come back home for a nickel. And for an extra nickel, you can go out to, to Santa Monica and go to Hoppy Land. Yeah. Hoppy Land, where uh, that uh, Bill Boyd built, Hopalong Castle. They don't know who Hopalong Yeah, I got yeah. people in my division at work that don't even know who Rogers is. Yeah. Jeez. Anyhow, um, one of the, like I said, uh, I, I really want kids to visit this place because what I say is history is in the subject. History is his story, her story, and my story. And kids have got to understand that history is people. You're in big trouble. <laughs> and they don't have to be three girls. Famous people. It's you know one of the things that I, I love is the kids come around and they say, <clears throat> look, the baby was bur uh, buried here. Another baby, they all go around and say, look at all the babies. I said, what are the dates? 1881 to 1883. I said, well, why are the babies died? Oh, there were no doctors. And I said, yeah, look in your books. 19, uh, 1881 to 1883 was uh, one of the worst flu pandemics, flu pandemics. Uh, in history. And they didn't have doctors. They didn't. The only thing, about the only thing they had out, out here to treat the flu was quinine. That was a very effective uh, uh, tool against uh, the flu. Quinine. Quinine. So you know, as you look around here, you see baby so and so and baby so and so. Look at the dates. They they coincide with the great uh, pandemic. With the flu and damage. So why don't we um, just. That's it. Bob, Virgil. There you go. I'm Bob. He's Bob. He's Virgil. I don't know about this point. Hi, I got it. It's Robert. Wait Robert. a second. Robert said about this place, they went to Paris. Virgil, give me the, give me the mic front. I'm going to pack it up. Thank you. There you go. The man in me's place? Glad you got me had it. Yeah. Now we'll knock something around there. Shin and Rosemead. Some of the more unusual. Yeah.